Hi, my name is Tom Daggy. I'm a geobotanist and geobotany is the study of habitats as they relate to conditions on the surface of the land. I've been pursuing a career in this for about 50 years. I graduated in botany and geography way back in 1969. I had a career in the University of Sheffield then until 1989, moving to be an environmental consultant in Scotland, where I've continued with consultancy and environmental research. The work in the UK has mainly been focused upon dunes. And this is why I've cited this talk at a place called Cool Links in South East Sutherland. And I'll talk more about cool later in this talk. How did my career start? Looking back, trying to search for those origins, it was probably somewhat traumatic. My greater family, my grandparents, uncles and aunts, or my cousins, moved in 1959. They emigrated to Australia. The result of that, because we didn't have an internet in those days, is that we had lots of letters and they contained stamps, which I collected. I became a a philatelist and I learned about the world, the countries, the places, their capitals, etc. In addition to that, we used to get occasional parcels and one of those parcels contained a mulga ruler. Mulga is a wood from the, the centre of Australia, from the savannah lands and the, the grasslands of central Australia and it contained pictures of, of plants and of Australian animals. It was my lightsaber at school because it would destroy the wooden rulers of my opponents in the sword fights that we used to have. Later at school, in 1965, I went on a, a schoolboy expedition with two other lads to the Pharaohs. And for six weeks, we looked at island life and the biology of the, the island my two companions were studying A-level biology. I was not. I was intrigued at their work, the way in which they were recording plants. Uh, they were examining animals on the seashore. It seemed to be a lot more interesting to me than the, the work I was doing upon the nature of the telephone exchange in the, in the village. When I returned to school, my last year, I decided to drop A-level economics and to do an A-level in biology. At the same time, I came across a book, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which seemed to show that terrifying things were, were happening to parts of the planet from mismanagement. And this was repeated in a book on rampant soil erosion, which I also found. So I decided to uh, look into a career which would be like that and I was accepted at the University of Hull to do a degree in botany and geography. Since then I went on to uh, research. My research in the UK has been upon coast and peat. I've worked a lot in Spain. I've looked at semi-arid vegetation in the southeast there. I've worked in Brazil. I've looked at forest clearance in the Amazon Basin. I've looked at the, the nature of uh, Cerrado vegetation, the savanna lands of central Brazil. As a consultant, my reputation has mainly come from undertaking the Sand Dune Vegetation Survey of Scotland, which ran from 1994 to 2000, in which I took earlier surveys, integrated them with all the remainder and I've mapped in detail with a GIS database 500 square kilometers of terrain. The talk today is really to illustrate how a geobotanist works. What sort of skills do you need to quantify and then understand
how habitat changes on land. And I'm going to take you through four sets of examples. In Spain, we'll look at hill slope vegetation change between 1975 and 2017. I'll take you to the Amazon basin to show you how forest clearance was recorded in the 1980s and then bring you up to date with the way in which the carbon store in the Amazon looks as if it's being lost from recent research in 2021. And then on to Colombia to show where a sudden change in the, uh, the desires of, uh, of society, especially their desire for illicit drugs, can degrade an important ecosystem very quickly. And then finally, I'll, I'll round up with Lynx Golf to see how that Lynx Golf affects sand dune habitat. And my main example here will be Cool Lynx, where there is a proposal for a golf course. I'm going to use some slides now to show you some of the projects which um, I've covered in my, in my time. I'm going to start in southeast Spain on some steep hill slopes where there were a couple of PhDs in the 70s and the 80s uh, which give us a baseline and I'm going to ask whether uh, there is if we go back and revisit those locations uh, any evidence in the vegetation for um, global warming. The vegetation is a, a type of shrubland called a tomulia. This is named after the, the dominant species, which are, are species of thyme. Uh, this is a rare habitat. It's declining. It's on the European red list of habitats. This is semi-arid southeast Spain. Uh, an air base nearby Alcantarilla shows a 1.4 degree uh, centigrade increase in temperature over a, a period of uh, about 30 to 40 years. Uh, and over that period, the rainfall has declined by about 9%. So it's only three, 300 millimetres. The information has been taken from seven sample areas uh, and they, the information here has been gathered in three phases. Uh, all seven sites, 75 to 81. There were four visits in 2003 to four, and then all, all, all study areas were, were sampled in 2017. For each of these study areas, the individual samples um, were, were collected in, in a stratified sampling so that we have an equal number in eight sectors of the, the aspect compass. And this means that we, we have a good uh, spread of sampling along a radiation continuum and therefore a, a heat continuum on these slopes. The maximum steep south, south facing slopes um, and then less than a third of that radiation on very steep north facing slopes. From the analysis, you can look at the, the really big contrasts uh, which you have on, on the spectrum of vegetation. On the left, you, you have uh, the, the site where in 1975 to 81, we, we had the coolest and the, and the wettest conditions. And then on the right, we have a very steep mile slope, which is the, uh, the hottest and the driest conditions in 2017. Putting all the information together, uh, well, the conclusions which has come out of this, this revisit survey is that climate heating has indeed strongly modified the existing topoclimates and vegetation. Now all sectors north to south have been shunted into to drier and warmer um, conditions compared to 1975-81. The species content and the structure of the vegetation has, has changed and it appears to be being reassembled into new types at the moment. There's been a very big reduction in cover and biomass for the species that were very prominent uh, 40 years ago. And it's very clear that this type of vegetation, the Tomli Yar, is now changing steadily to uh, a type of steppe, um, which is perhaps a precursor to even desert conditions. In 19... 87, I joined the Royal Geographical Society's expedition to Marikar Island. Uh, I worked with a team led by Dr. Peter Furley at the University of Edinburgh 
and we were working mainly off island at changes in land use but particularly the amount of deforestation and my tasks equipped with a Brazilian bicycle supplied by the the RGS uh, was to to gather information uh, as as ground truth for interpreting satellite images uh, Maracar Island is particularly useful for this because around it there is um, savanna land, the Brazilian Cerrado, uh, and we have a transition to Amazon rainforest. It is an excellent area for, for looking at land use change. A couple of examples here of what were found on the left, armed with my bicycle. I could pedal uh, uh, parallel with the, 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 the rivers which you can, can see and record the, the land uses. And there is one example, if you look at the TM September 1985 image here, you'll see uh, a square area, very visible. This is an area of, of forest clearance. If you move to the right, uh, this is an area of, called Alto Alegre. It's much smaller scale in, in terms of the, the, the mapping. I was given a, a vehicle for, for a week to, uh, to collect the information here. Uh, and it's a known area of deforestation. And you can see the contrast between the 1978 and the 1985 image by the very sharp rectangular, uh, rectilinear patterns of, of tracks and clearance, which have come in in only seven years. The result showed that of the forests which existed in the area in 1978, almost 2,400 square kilometers, 7% of that disappeared over seven years. And that rate was actually very similar to what was being recorded elsewhere in the Amazon basin at this stage in time. And of course, it's continued uh, with some a period of control, but it now appears to be getting out of hand. In 1991, um, I did a form of environmental audit and produced a state of the environment report for Scotland on behalf of Scottish Wildlife and Countryside Link. Um, a large number of chapters, about 80 pages, uh, all very much out of date at the moment, but it's interesting to go back and, and look at changes in, in environment and policy over time. Uh, I look in particular here with these blue highlights at global warming. And that marks text which covered global warming as an issue in Scotland. And at that time, uh, it's clear that we didn't have the same urgency that we now require at the moment. Another project in 1992 was to perform environmental audit and some monitoring in Colombia. And this was a wee bit dangerous. Uh, in the early 90s, the drug barons were mixing cocaine and heroin to produce crack cocaine. And the heroin was being cultivated in deforested areas up in the Andes in the cloud forest. Uh, this area was around Cali to, to the southeast and my work was to go in and look at the, what the, the impacts were for aerial spraying of these illicit crops using the, uh, the herbicide glyphosate. Uh, I had five days clattering up and down the, the Amazon in helicopter gunships. There's a picture of one there uh, with a heavy machine gun mounted on the side. Uh, and I passed places like a national park at Munchiki, where you can see very large tracts of cloud forest which have been cleared with a mosaic of habitat successions coming up upon them. Uh, and some of these plots did contain the opium poppies or amapola as the Colombians call it. To do an, an audit, I had to inspect the areas where the fuel and the glyphosate were loaded. Uh, you can see a couple of uh, herbicide spraying aircraft there and a, a small helicopter which was used for very precise spraying. I took a flight in one of those aircraft to observe the, the, the accuracy uh, of the, the, the actual nozzles delivering the, um, the, the spray and another location I actually was sprayed myself um, as, as an experiment so that I could actually measure the size of the, the droplets to see that they conform to, to best practice. In all this work, I was accompanied by Carlos Alba from the state organization I was working for. 
uh, and we were escorted with uh, narcotics police who were all armed and they were led by Capitan Juan Guerrero. I concluded that the spraying program was pretty precise. I was very concerned about the loss of the cloud forest, the Bosque Andino, because 75% of that had already gone by 1984, according to the, 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 the national maps. Of the remainder, the Amapola cultivation was responsible for, just, for a further 0.7% of all the Colombian forest in one year before we've, we've since seen an exponential use um, of, of this land for, for opium poppy cultivation. I pointed out that we, we know uh, very little about the effects of glyphosate on these ecosystems and I made a proposal for actually monitoring that and investigating it in terms of impacts on soils and water courses. A contract was offered a year later but I turned it down because simply Colombia was too dangerous a place to work at that stage in time. We also now know that glyphosate is a carcinogen. This issue of herbicide spraying from the air is extremely controversial in, in Colombia. And you may have noticed that the Extinction Rebellion um, demonstrations in London recently included people from Colombia protesting that this is still going on. Uh, and it seems to be endlessly. It is not controlling um, the the deforestation. That's a society problem to sort. Herbicide is not going to do it. I've been back to Colombia in 2012 not to do anything upon deforestation but to actually get above the, the forest line above 4,000 meters and I had a marvelous visit in Paramo um, habitat with world experts uh, and here we're standing close to the stem rosettes of, of one of the marvelous species which you get. In these environments during the day, the temperature goes up to 25 degrees, but at night, everything freezes up. That's a tremendous oscillation over 20, 24 hours. And so we come to cool inks again. The, I've used my skills here to lead opposition to a golf course. The dunes are compact, but are extremely diverse. I feel it's, it's a great shame that this area could be lost. The slide lists the many important natural features of, of cool. They are considerable. And I also show the footprint of the 2017 golf proposal, which has already been refused by Scottish ministers. Now, my opposition on environment has been based again on environmental audit. I have combed most parts of that footprint and I've checked the developer information. And I will give you an, an example shortly of one serious error. There are many of those errors and when I put them all together it gave me no confidence at all in the environmental work which had been done in 2017. I'm standing in the centre of the 13th fairway of the golf course which was planned for cool links and submitted in 2017. I'm 80 metres away from the 13th green, which is sited on dry dune, which is behind the three metre tall willow scrub in the centre of the screen. I've done an audit of the developer's mapping here and I have a, a major concern. The habitat in front of me is dune slack, a type of wetland. It was flooded up to 90 centimetres deep in January and there was some standing water here in July, but there is none at the moment. We're in the middle of a considerable drought. My problem is that the developer's map shows only dry dune here, no wetland nearby at all. This dune slack has been ignored in the mapping. And this is one of many mapping errors that the audit has found. This dune slack is also one of the best at cool. It has the full range of slack habitat because it's nicely zoned. The errors in developer mapping, plus many other concerns on environmental work, have led me to oppose the golf course proposal here. This is highly protected ground. It is a site of special scientific interest. 
a special protection area with remarkable birds and it's a Ramsar site which is of international importance as a wetland. So society has valued this ground by making those designations. A golf course is not appropriate here. We had a four-week planning inquiry in 2019 that confirmed that. Here at Cool Links, I am surrounded by carbon. There is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere I'm breathing. I'm exhaling carbon dioxide into that atmosphere. I kick the soil and I know that there's some shell sand in that. I'm standing on vegetation which is made up of carbohydrates which have been fixed from atmospheric carbon dioxide. And the carbon in the plants goes down via a root system and some of these plants probably go down for two, three, maybe even four meters. So looking at this ecosystem, I see myself surrounded by species. The geobotanist has to be able to identify these and realize their importance. So around me, I can see a wide leaf plant, lime grass, I can see marum grass, key species. I can see the common knapweed, I can see false oak grass, I can see hairy oak grass. There are lots of species present. If I listed them all, we would have more than 50. I then start to think as a geobotanist about the past of this dune. I'm halfway down the dune, which goes up to 15 meters in height. But I know that this dune started initially at an altitude of three meters, just above sea level. And at that time, we're talking now decades, centuries, sea level has been falling. That dune went from three meters altitude up to 15 meters because of mainly one species, the magical marron grass. We call it a keystone species. Keystone because it supports and drives everything else which happens through time. Marron grass will grow up through up to half a metre of sand being dropped upon it in its growing season. It takes carbon from the atmosphere and makes carbohydrate. It takes silica from the, from the dune sand and it makes them into its, it, its very tightly rolled leaves which can do all that growth. And here at Cool, it's built up a frontal dune system 10 to 15 metres high and I've estimated from here to the north end of Cool Links, we probably have about half a million tons of sand within this frontal dune, which is, is, is placed before the rest of the dune system. It's an extremely important frontal dune because it protects a winter lock in land, which is the habitat in winter for in very important large numbers of wintering birds. And we have a large number of other rare plants and species in other dune habitats, all protected by this frontal dune created by Marin. But what's the future of this dune ridge and for the dune interior? To start with, I have to defer now to coastal geomorphology. Recently, in late September, a project in Scotland called Dynamic Coast issued a report, September 2021, which said that this vegetation edge between 2018 and 2015, 2050, will migrate in land by 13 metres. From 2050 to 2100, it's going to migrate in land 80 metres. So we've got a 93 metre movement inshore. What effect is that going to have on habitats? The habitats here at Cool will migrate inland as the, the foredune moves inland as well. They will adapt to the conditions and the balance of habitats, although they might shift in terms of how much is wet and how much is dry, they will overall have the same sort of spread. That's the way in which natural change is going to take place. But we have an alternative suggestion for use of land here at Cool, a golf course 
is proposed for this area. In 2017, a proposal was made which was then refused by the Scottish Government in 2020, but people have not accepted that decision and they are determined to put in a second planning application and we expect it any time. In 2017, two holes were proposed for this frontal dune, one just behind me here. If this location is going to move as a dune system inland for 90 odd meters, they will need a sea wall here. That will cost millions of pounds. We have a freshwater stream inlet beneath us here, which is a weak point. And we will then have salt flooding behind the sea wall, which will then go into all the, the habitats in the winter lock, and it could affect the wintering birds in this area. So altogether here, I find it impossible to predict what's going to be happening. It's certainly not future smart, and a sea wall in this location would not be future proof. And I have to leave you there with the future of cool undecided at the moment.